Not yet. Good day, everyone, and this is an exceptional speaker live stream on Facebook with uh, myself, Paul Dutois, and my co-author of the exceptional speaker, Alan Stevens. Nice to see you. Yeah, absolutely. And we're here to talk to you about storytelling. And I'm going to kick off by just maybe speaking a little bit about the origins of storytelling and why it's so relevant to us today and ask Alan to chip in uh, where he sees fit. And, and the amazing thing is that it's believed that storytelling was actually around before speech. And the way it happened was that events were recorded using rock art. So storytelling effectively goes back um, in excess of 30,000 years BC. So we're talking about 32,000 years or, or more. Now, Alan, in your opinion, why do you feel that storytelling is such a vital component of speeches? And how does it make a difference? Thanks, Paul. I mean, storytelling, as you say, is an ancient art, an ancient practice. And I think what's, what's evident about storytelling is that it's a way of getting a message from one person to another. It, yeah. It's more than just communication. I mean, people talk about storytelling as a form of communication. I think it's far more than that. Yeah. I think what storytelling does is to short circuit the learning process. Yeah. It allows us, for example, to explain something using storytelling which people can learn much faster than even if we explain it to them because yeah. people just get storytelling they understand how that works yeah. and i think your example of rock art is absolutely perfect you know somebody looking at a mammoth with spears in it and people standing around it know exactly how to go and hunt a mammoth yeah without having precisely. A, a two and a half hour explanation of what they have to do but but isn't it remarkable how when we're born we we just instinctively fall into wanting stories as a, as a small child. Mm. You, you can tell us a child a nice simple story that's got a, a bit of a flow and you'll have the child mesmerized, although the child can't even speak yet. Um, and, and that addiction for stories seems to happen at a very young age. And I think it's got a yeah. lot to do with the, the history of stories and how it's been the method of passing down information from generation to generation. I absolutely agree. And I think you're, you're right about children. You know, we've both told stories to our children, you know, so we understand yeah. how that works. Yeah. And the thing is, story, storytelling must have some kind of intrinsic element to it. There must be something within us that responds to stories being told because stories allow you to experience something without having had the physical experience. Yeah. And I think that's 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 what we respond to. I think that thing inside us, which we would otherwise learn through experience, through going out in the world and so on, stories allow us not to have to do that. And I think that's why they're they're quite reassuring. You can tell a child a happy story or a slightly sad story or, or a story that relaxes them. And we've all done those things and we've all heard those things. Yeah. And I think as a result of that, storytelling in speeches is it's a critical element because we have that deep understanding and response to it and don't you find that when you listen to a speech that has one or more well-crafted stories it seems to just catch you and bring you along mm. like a flowing river in other words you, you you almost feel as if as if you're more fully engaged than if you were experiencing albeit an interesting but a data dump well, no, absolutely, and, and and that's it. You talk about engagement. You, of course, you you've got to be engaged. You've got to be having some of the emotions that the speaker is having. You've got to be vicariously reliving the experience that they're talking about, particularly if it's a personal story that they're telling you, rather rather than a myth or a fable. Yeah. So I think it's it's something which helps us as speakers to explain a complex message in a simple and relatable way. Yeah. So I think if a speaker is not using storytelling, they're actually missing the bad trick in the book. I agree with you completely. And what's also nice about a story is if it, if you're putting together the content 
uh, of a speech and there's various components of it, stories can help you to remember it better and mm. can get you a lot more animated because you're, you're, you're speaking about something that's, that's real. It, it might be experienced. And, and you and I have had one or two interesting discussions about w whether mm -hmm. we can deliver a made-up story or whether it's always got yeah. to be true. So what's your take on that? I, I think it has to be essentially true. Um, sometimes things happen in reality that, and we think, oh, I wish it had gone that way or I wish I'd finished with that line or something yeah. like that. And we can do that when we're storytelling. I think a certain amount of embroidery or embellishment or whatever you want to call it is, is appropriate. And in fact, I mean, you, you and I have shared stages many times. I remember we were in, we were in Paris some years ago yeah. uh, and you were, you were telling a story about, uh, I think, teaching your daughter to walk yeah, that's right. by helping her around the garden. Yeah. With, a, with a little rubber band or something attached between you and so on. It was a lovely, lovely story. It may have been exactly as it happened. Yeah. And it may have been slightly amended. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It was a beautiful story. And in fact, I remember the translator was following you around the stage doing the yeah. same actions, which was quite entertaining. Well, but, that... but, the story, but the story itself doesn't have to be absolutely 100% true as long as the essence is there. Yeah. But now... Uh, What's interesting about that is that you go and read any of the Harry Potter novels, and those are completely mm -hmm. made up. There's no truth whatsoever. Yeah, of course. So of course. Uh, what one can make up a story completely and write it in a novel. Why shouldn't we, one be able to make up a story to illustrate a point? Is that legitimate? Well, to some extent, you, yeah, and some people do. Uh, and is it legit? Well, that's for them to decide. It's not, it's not for me to say to people whether they can tell stories they made up or not yeah. my feeling is that a story will be far more powerful if you've got an investment in it yeah so you may have been a protagonist or you may have been an observer hmm. or it, it may have been just something that was on the periphery of, of what you noticed but in some way or other you will have a connection to that i think it helps you to tell it because you can tell it far more effectively yeah it helps the audience to understand it yeah because they can read it they can become part of it and also, as you said earlier on, helps you to remember it. Yeah. Um, because you, and, and the other thing, fourth, I, I like three, three things of three. I've got a fourth one, unfortunately, which is if you tell a story that you've made up or heard, somebody else can tell it. Yeah. So it's equally valid for me or you to tell the same story if it's, if it's been made up by one yeah. of us. And I've and heard I've of stories speakers. I've heard of speakers um, sitting in the audience and hearing another speaker tell their story that actually happened to them. And how weird must I, that I've be? been with a speaker where that happened. I've been sitting with a speaker in the audience where somebody on stage told their signature story. It's quite a bizarre experience. And I think we've all seen bits of that. I mean, I've, I've heard a story of mine on the radio yeah. um, that clearly didn't happen to this person who told it on the radio, but it does, in a sense, that doesn't matter too much. But I think the important thing, and, and you're a great advocate of this and a great person who demonstrates this, is that you, you've got to put in the the detail and the elements which make people think they're there. I mean, you've got some wonderful stories. You tell, and some of your stories, they are mythical stories. Yeah. No, about the, 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 one, the one you tell about the mountain in Cape Town, for yeah. example. Yeah. And the guy smoking his pipe and the white, big white cloud coming out and all that sort of yeah. thing. And it's a great story. That didn't actually happen. No, well, but it's, a terrific story. it's it's difficult to know because he met the devil up there <laughs> and he only realized it was the yeah. devil when he turned around and he saw the forked tail from between the mm. split in the coat. So it's it's it, it's positioned as a legend. And mm. um, and it it I actually first told it on stage at the Global Speakers Summit in Cape Town in 2009, um, which gave it a lot of context, mm. especially for the international guests. But I think one, yes. yeah, so, so it answers the question about can one tell a story that is perhaps a legend or something that's made up? I mean, if you go to mm. Greek mythology, it's highly probable that a lot of those stories were in fact made up. Absolutely true. And I, I, my keynote speech, my own keynote speech from Prometheus, I use a Greek myth. Yeah. I actually bracket the story. It's a technique yeah. we'll talk about. Bracket the story yeah. with a Greek myth. Yeah. Because it makes the point very well. But there's a, in, in between that, there's a lot of truth. Yeah. So it's probably 90% true, yeah. the speech as a whole. But we've got that. It's wrapped in a myth. And I think that's okay. Well, I, I want to just go back into 
why stories are so compelling. And before I go there, I've got a, a question for you, and that is, can you have a very short story, like 25, 30 seconds, and a very long story that works that's 30 minutes? Or do they essentially have to be a certain length? What do you, what's your take on that? I think stories can be any length. There's that wonderful story that uh, I, I think was written by Hemingway. I'm not sure. Um, six words. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a story. You know, all of a sudden you can, you can, you can build your imagination around that and what, what the, the, the actual story might be. Or you can have a story that goes on at great length. My feeling is that if you're going to tell a really compelling story, it needs to be reasonably tight, 10 minutes-ish. Yeah. I think if stories are going to go on a lot longer than that, then there's a danger of losing people's interest and losing your own. Well, we so I, I would tend, I'd tend to go around about 10 minutes for a good story. Okay, so 10 minutes on average. I mean, we've mm. seen uh, Sean Weaver deliver his amazing story where his entire speech was simply one story from beginning till end, and That's he had right. us riveted. So if you, right. if you really know what you're doing and you're a great storyteller, you can pull that off. You can, but it, it needs a rare talent. Um, I mean, Sean, Sean is a natural storyteller, if there ever was one. Yeah. He's also learned techniques. Yes, of course. You know, he's, he's honed his skills. And, but I think that's quite rare. And I think for most people, and I include myself in that, mm. for most people, I'm, I'm probably going to tell stories that are around uh, 10 minutes in length at most. Yeah. I'm not going to try a 30-minute story because I don't have the talent to do it. Okay. You say you may not have the talent to do it, but... You mentioned that somebody like Sean, who's naturally a good teller, a storyteller, mm -hmm. also learned techniques. Oh, so yeah. what you're really saying is that good storytelling um, skills can, in fact, be learned and rehearsed. Absolutely, like almost any skill. Yeah. Um, you, you can learn, you can get better. We're always honing, you and I are always honing our stories. Of course. We're always honing our techniques. We, you never stop learning. And I think there are, there are a number of techniques that you can learn. There are ways that you can create characters. There are ways that you can talk about the story arc, the transformation from the open to the close. Yeah. And there are ways that you can bring people into the story, even if they've never experienced something like that. Yeah. By using phrases like, this is a bit like this situation. You can give them an example of a situation they have experienced and then relate that back into the story again. Yeah. And those are techniques you can learn. You're quite right. Yeah. So we spoke also about um, a shorter length story. And I think it's a tremendous art to be able to, for instance, craft a song. And mm. in that song of maybe four or five verses, be able to tell a story. And one of the best examples oh, yeah. of a group that does that is Steely Dan. They've got a song called Haitian mm. Divorce, where they speak uh -huh. about... Um, um, these two that met each other and they were so in love, the preacher's face went dead. Um, after a few days, everyone knew the thing was dead. Uh, and then th they managed to encapsulate the entire story of a romance going sour in about two verses. Um, and they had this amazing ability. There's another song called With a Gun from Pretzel Logic where this guy comes into a shop and because he owed the shopkeeper money, he shoots him dead. It's called With a Gun. And they have this amazing ability to tell a very compelling story in a short space of time. Now, surely that's quite an art. It, it is an art. and It's an art that lots of um, singers and songwriters like your good self, uh, managed to manage to do very well. And I mean, I, I would always defer to somebody like Dylan as well, who, yeah. who is an extraordinary poet yeah. and storyteller, Absolutely. is able to, within three or four minutes, or sometimes in a longer one, like the, I don't know, Lily Rosemary and the Jack of Hearts, which yeah. is one of his great story songs, which lasts for about seven and a half minutes, that to, to draw you in to something, and yeah, another world. And I think that's, that's what storytellers. That's what storytellers do. And certainly, listening to your stories, and you might, you know, refer to an example, perhaps, uh, of a story that you've that you've used and told, which is in, incredibly effective at drawing people in. Yeah. Well, uh, th there is one in particular that also fits the um, 
uh, frame, if you like, of embellishing a story where I was um, stopped by a traffic cop. And um, what happened was that I saw these lines across the road. It was many years ago, and I slowed down. So by the time I got to where the traffic cop was, I was, I was going quite slowly. And the story goes around the repartee between the traffic cop and myself. Now, the interesting thing about it is that I can't today remember exactly what happened because I've told the story so many <laughs> times and embellished it and changed it and added in things that have worked. The, the, the essential story and the punchline is the same. So it, it, what happened in the end is that I didn't get a ticket and the speed hmm. limit was 100 kilometers an hour. So I checked with him and I said, well, um, what is actually the speed limit? He said, no, it's 100, you see. So I said, well, what speed can I go without getting a ticket? So he looked at me and he said, it's a very good question, sir. If you go 110, it's okay. You see? And that's the, that's the punchline at the end. But um, I tell it in a customer service um, context, showing that even traffic yeah. officers can treat the public with respect and in a friendly way and that they don't need to be aggressive. And if a traffic officer can do that, what's wrong with the rest of us? So it's that, it's that kind Absolutely of thing. Absolutely right. So um, it's a story with a moral. Yes, it is. And and here you are now pouncing onto a very interesting thing. Do stories have to be funny? Do they have to have a moral? Um, what sort of different types of stories do we get? I don't I don't think stories have, have to be funny, at least not laugh out loud funny. Yeah. I think they have to be engaging. A story could be sad. Yeah. Uh, you can you can tell a sad story which has got a very little humor in it. Generally speaking, we want, we want to put a little bit of humour in, and even, even the saddest stories can contain a small amount of humour. Yeah. As for whether it's a moral, or sometimes an Aesop, as we would call it, after the person who created those fables, I'm, I think it has to have a message. Now, whether, that, whether you want to call that a moral or, or something else doesn't really matter. Yeah. But that has to, let's, say, let's, say, let's call it a point. A story has to have some point. Yes. There's got to be a point to telling it rather than just exercising your jaw muscles. There's got, there's got to be a reason why you're telling that to somebody else, yeah. because it will be a benefit, it'll entertain them, it'll amuse them, or, or whatever it is. If you're just talking for the sake of talking, because yeah. you enjoy it, then you shouldn't be doing it, at least not in front of somebody else. Yeah. So it's a good idea to test out a story on an audience before mm -hmm. you, well, on a safe audience, before you deliver it to a paid audience. I, I, ideally, yes, though I'd be a bit wary of that. Uh, and I use my own experience here. For example, I do a bit, you know, as you do too, do a bit of stand-up comedy uh, from time to time. And I try out my jokes on my wife, Heather, and she rarely laughs. Nevertheless, I sometimes put the jokes in anyway. Yeah. I think my problem with my poor wife is that she has to hear my same jokes over and over again because I like <laughs> repeating them. So that's the disadvantage that she has to live with. Um, I, I just want to go back a bit to the way storytelling has changed because I alluded <laughs> earlier on to it was originally rock art and then yeah. only afterwards it would seem from what I've researched we we came up with speech that was more than just sounds of animals mm. and what have you. So language was developed in different co continents by different tribes and, and, and what have you and the photograph, let me just see if I've got it here. The photograph only came about 1826. So yeah, I was, was, was going to say around about, I was going to say 1830. So you, okay, yeah. fair enough. I'll go with that. Apparently, yeah. yeah, the first photograph technique, visual storytelling, 1826. So prior to that, you had to actually paint pictures with words which is yes. a skill that a lot of people still have. And it's, it's vital to a story, even if you don't have pictures. But things have changed. And what has changed? You're a media man, so you can share that with us. Well, I, I think what has changed is that it, uh, people talk about, you know, are you visual or literary or kinesthetic? I, I don't believe all that. And I think that was disproved by neuroscience a long time ago. Mm -hmm. However, we do like pictures and we do like sound and we do like feel, I suppose, sort of touch and feel. Yeah, I think, I think I don't think that people's attention span has changed either, and that's something that people often say. Oh, our attention span is much shorter than it used to be. Well, no, I don't think it is, because that's a biological thing. Yeah, I think what's happened is that there is far more stimulation. Yes, 
than, than there ever used to be. And I, I think you know, a good example, and I don't know whether this is true or whether it's apocryphal, but I remember somebody saying a few years ago that the information contained a single issue of the Washington Post was as much as people in the 18th century ever learned in their lifetimes. Wow. So in other words, you know, a single day's newspaper now yeah. is equivalent to a lifetime of knowledge 200 years ago. Yeah. And I think that I think that's the difference. I think the difference is that the amount of information which is available to us is now almost limitless. Yeah. All, all of us carry these sorts of things yeah. which have the world in them. That's right. You, we, facts. We don't, we don't need to remember facts anymore. We can look them up. Well, this, and as a result of that, yeah. you know, storytelling for information is, is, is less of an issue, but storytelling for entertainment and enlightenment is more of an issue. That's very interesting. I mean, we've just experienced a situation where we watched a war on television live while it was happening. Yeah. Which is just extraordinary. And I think the first time we really experienced that was the Iraq war. Um, yes, that's right. And we suddenly had these things happening and being filmed live or recorded shortly afterwards. And we were sitting watching them all over the world in our living room. So that's what's to a large extent has changed. We used to paint pictures just with words. Now we've got the ability to bring pictures into it. And with the technology now available, a lot of people have become addicted to using PowerPoint. So let's talk a little bit They have, bit unfortunately. About... How sad that is. Well, this is what I wanted to come to because you're a firm believer that people should still be painting their pictures with the words. Can you speak yes. to us a bit about that? I can. I'll, I'll refer back to an old story. Again, it may be apocryphal. I'm telling other people's stories a little bit here. But it, yeah. the story is told that Nacho Marx, one of the old uh, film comedians, a member of the Marx Brothers, yeah. was once attending a school, giving a talk. And said to one of the students who was there, do you prefer, in fact, he said film, he could have said TV, but he said, do you prefer film or radio? Yeah. And the student said, I prefer the radio, sir, because the pictures are better. Yeah. And I thought that's, that's a great, it may not be true, but it makes the point that the pictures that we create in our heads as a result of hearing a speech, of hearing something being delivered, are much better than the pictures you could ever see. Even with CGI and things exploding every 20 minutes, 20 seconds or so, when you see them on a, on a big screen, you can still have a better set of imagery that you've created yourself when you read a book. Yeah. Or, no, no or when you hear somebody telling a story or a great speech. And I think that I think that will always be the case. We, we can create our own image. And as soon as you bring in PowerPoint, as soon as you start showing somebody an image of something, or worse yet, a series of words on a page. Yeah, you take away their imagination. Yes, you you don't allow them to think. You show them what they're supposed to think about. I think that's I think that's a shame, and I think it's it's much better not to. I think you're absolutely right. So, I hope you've brought a story with us. Maybe a short one that you can share as part of this, because um, I've got one that I can uh, possibly uh, bring along. It was one that I. Uh, I used recently in a speech, and the, the whole objective of the story was trying to illustrate a pillar of a system that I put together about mm. changing your mindset. Um, <clears throat> so I'm giving you a break while you think of which of your great stories to pick. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, in, in this particular one, um, I spoke about my uh, daughter, who was, I think, 11 years old. She was in the netball team, and uh, she'd managed to get herself into the D team. Sport wasn't really her thing. And we've got this hoop, um, it, it, but it's not a netball hoop. It's a bigger basketball hoop that's mounted sort of in the driveway. So for a 12-year-old to actually get the ball through that hoop is is quite mm. a task. Anyway, she, we used to throw the ball and then she used to try and get it. And she could never throw the ball through this hoop because it was too big. And the one day she said, Dad, let's go and throw the ball. So we went to go and throw the ball. And um, she was throwing and missing and throwing and missing and she got to number 14 or 15 and she missed and she missed and eventually when there was when we were at 17 I said okay let's try three more and then we'll go inside 20 she missed 21 <laughs> she kept going anyway she got to number 56 
and it was starting to get dark and she was getting tired and she was getting a bit upset. And I said, all right, when we hit number 60, that's it. Let's go and have supper. So number 60, she misses. I said, come, let's go inside. She catches the ball like this and she says, dad, tonight I'm going to throw that ball through the hoop. So when Jenna says she's going to do something, she's going to do it. So yep. she stood there. Number 61, she threw it. It didn't even touch the rim. It just went straight through. And of course, there were these mighty <laughs> celebrations and hugs and what have you. And I said, come, let's go in and have some supper. She says, Dad, I have to do it again. I thought, oh, my goodness, we're going to be here till after midnight. <laughs> so the next throw, she misses. The next one, she threw it, and it landed on the rim. And it just hung there for about three seconds mm -hmm. and then dropped in. And she ran and caught it and turned around to me and said, now we can go and have supper. Very good. <laughs> and to me, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely example of a, the determination and perseverance mm. of someone so young who one feels shouldn't have known any better, but yet she was able to demonstrate to an adult, you know, when you fall off the bike, you get back on. When you keep missing, you keep trying, and eventually it will happen. So that's my story you got one for me okay well let me share a story with you that you won't have heard because you've not heard me tell this story before i haven't i haven't told them this story on stage at all or even on screen and it's quite a sad it's a little bit of a sad story but it's got a yeah. it's got a point to it and some um two years ago uh, in olympic park which is near where i live in east london we had an art installation called shrouds of the song and it was an artist who had created some small goals about 12 inches high and wrapped them in a shroud to look like a, a body and then laid them all out in a field yeah. in Olympic Park. And in fact, he had laid out 60,000 of these small goals wrapped in shrouds to represent all of the 60,000 people who felt the song in, in the first week. An astonishing thing. And we and I was a, a volunteer in the park, I still am, and we were taking people who uh, had mobility issues by in a little buggy down to the, the art installation so they could, they could look at them. And a lot of people had a connection. It was a, a grandfather or a great uncle who fought in the song. I had two great uncles mm. who fought in the first war. One of them did die at the song. Um, and in fact, bought, I bought the doll that, that represented him. I've, I've got it somewhere. Yeah. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is I took a uh, a wonderful gentleman down and he told the story of his grandfather um who had, who had died at the somme and as it happened his wife had been pregnant which is this man's father uh, gave birth to this man's father so he, he never knew his grandfather and i took him down and he stood at the edge of the field and he looked out across these sixty thousand shrouded dolls and wept he wept silently and uh, I just left him for a few minutes. Then I went back and said, you're okay. And he said, I'm fine. He said, I want, I'd like to go back now. So I took him back, back up to the station. And on the way back, he was telling me this story. And he said, he said I, I never understood what my grandmother talked about when she talked about what happened to the song. Because obviously she had letters from hmm. her husband before, before he died. And he said, he said, thank you. It's only today that I've understood what happened yeah. 100 years ago. And he said, for that, I, I'm so grateful that I've, that I've understood that. And I thought, that, that is extraordinary, isn't it? That, it? that something like that, a piece of art, brought someone to tears, allows them to understand something they've, they've never really understood about a memory or something like that. And I thought that was, that was quite, in a way, it was quite lovely. It's quite sad. Yeah. But it's also quite lovely. So it's the, the impact that art can have on, on well, someone. You've conjured up something in my mind because my grandfather was a medic in Delville Wood. Mm. And because he emerged alive, even though he was shot, um, mm. I'm, I exist only because of that. Yeah, exactly. And um, during 2019, so two years ago over winter, I actually read the Delville Wood book. And... Mm. What it brought out to me is that there are so many stories that are untold. Now, what these soldiers used yeah. to do is they used to write down things in their um, journals. Mm. And this chap by the name of Ace managed to collect a lot of these journals up and 
put together mm. the Delville Wood based on uh, the Delville Wood book based on what these people had been through. Uh, but the one in particular mm. that really moved me was he said that um, during the war, when they got you out, you were allowed a week's leave and you went back home. And he said not one of those soldiers deserted and chickened out. They all came mm. back because of this incredible sense of honor that they had. And the one story mm. that really got to me was how this one youngster was cut off on all four sides and he was defending his position for five days without water. And the, tears, mm -hmm. the tongue in his mouth had started swelling because it was so dry. Mm. He had no water, he had no food, and eventually they managed to break through and pull him out and he lived to tell the tale. Right. But the, just yeah. the way that they'd extracted mm. that information out of his journal. And it's those kinds of things that really move us. So, yes, it doesn't have to be funny. Yeah. It can, be, it can yeah. be really inspirational. But I think one of the things, Alan, that we are incredibly passionate about is to encourage people not to just think that we have stories mm. because we're speakers. Everyone has stories. They do. And That's what right. should they do with those stories when they remember them? <laughs> write them down record Where? them you know tell tell their phone uh, record it in there uh, yeah. write it down do something film themselves telling the story stories get lost and i think it's such a great shame that you know we used to have an oral tradition of yeah. passing stories on we've lost that to some extent yeah but i think the the fact that we can now record things so easily yeah. and make them available to future generations i think it's it's almost an obligation for us to tell tell our stories and record our stories so that like the stories that we've just shared about something that happened 100 years ago, yeah. people 100 years from now can listen and watch our stories. That would be a great thing, wouldn't it? Well, it would be. And, in fact, this is how many of the tribes have passed down information of incredible value, things like medical information, ancestral information. Uh, it's historically been passed by word of mouth before proper mm. writing came about. So... I think we've got to we've, we've got to spread the word that storytelling is such a critical way of getting information around, particularly rare information. And one of the things it is, that, and not only that. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Well, well, not I, only I, that. I was going to say it's something that we help people do. Yes, it is indeed. Here comes the advert. <laughs> well, you can see the exceptionalspeaker.com <laughs> down there. So go, go and have a look. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, but it, it, it is such a crucial way of getting information. And what, one of the things, one of the saddest things really, is most of the very best stories eventually go untold or unheard by most people. If you just That's take fine. a war that has taken place now, all the stories out of that war in the last, uh, in, in, in this month, could fill volumes, mm. all people's individual stories, experiences, suffering, um, heroism, bravery. Um, many of those stories will eventually go untold. So our message to you is don't leave your story untold. Write it down, record it in your phone. Have a storybook where you keep your stories, your, your, your sad ones, your happy ones, your ones with a moral, uh, the stories where you can impart information that you have that's very rare. Exactly. And a story file, story book, whatever you want to call it. It's something I've kept for years. You keep one too, I know. Yeah. And I think it's not just whether you're a storyteller. Mm. It's whether you have stories. And as we've already established, everyone has a story. We all do. And therefore, I think it's, it's really important to write those things down. Very much so. So, Alan, do you have a... I think we've done a final word already, but all we want to encourage Pretty speakers much. to do is to bring stories into your speeches, uh, don't be afraid to, mm -hmm. and don't ever think that your story isn't good enough. It, you know, you, you can't have the best story ever told because there's so many stories that's been told. Just back yourself. Um, take whatever story it is. If it helps you to get a particular message, be courage courageous. Go forward and deliver that story. Um, and just remember something. You're never going to satisfy everybody. You're never going to get no. a situation where 100% of the people thought your story was absolutely knockout. But I can assure you there will be a few people that you really move. There might be a few people that you make laugh. doesn't matter. Tell your story. And you'll find that the more you tell your story, 
the better you get at it. Absolutely. And people who tell stories are uh, interesting, attractive and intelligent. And therefore, why wouldn't you? Well, exactly. And they often get promoted. They do. Because they can tell stories. <laughs> Folks, so thanks for being with us. Uh, Thank we you. trust you found that interesting. Um, if you did, we might do one of these again and pick another topic related to exceptional speaking. So we've just published a book together. There it is. You might have to go to one Look side. That. There it is. It. There it is. It's called The Exceptional yeah. Speaker, How to Deliver Sensational Speeches. Let me see if I can put that bit up. There we go. How to Deliver Sensational Speeches. And um, it's a revised edition. We had the original one, which we published seven and a half years ago. And this one is a severely edited, um, compact a collection of speaking tips that if you're serious about speaking, you might want to get hold of. And if you want to know how to do Bigger, that. It's better, it's heavier, and it's fantastic value. Well, it is indeed. And the, the blessed thing weighs 756 grams. And I don't know what that is in pounds, but it's about a pound and a half or something. Don't say that too loud. As far as the post office is concerned here in the UK, it weighs 750 grams. Okay. Because that's the limit above which you go into the next postage. Oh, really? Okay. So, so I'm we'll call it 750 grams. grams. Perfect. Good stuff. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thanks, everyone, for being with thank us. Thank you. And um, thank you. If you were listening and watching, thank you very much. Indeed. And uh, we'll let you know when we have another one of our 3 p.m. if you're in the UK, 4 p.m. if you're in South Africa, and something else p.m. if you were somewhere else. So cheers. Okay. Nice to have you with us. Bye for now. Cheers.